Working Cows Podcast, episode 280. This episode is brought to you by Farming Without the Bank. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the C90 Ocean Minerals Studios. And this episode is brought to you by Farming Without the Bank. None of you are farming like you did 100 years ago. Why are you financing it like you did 100 years ago? The biggest part of your operation is the money that runs through your hands, and you let someone else control that. The bank gets the final say in what you get money for and when you pay it back. For many, this is a great relationship, until it's not. Farming Without the Bank shows you how you can take back control of your money so you can make it so you can make the bank plan B instead of plan A. This is done by you creating your own banking system. You own and control. To learn more, tune into the Farming Without the Bank podcast and go to farmingwithoutthebank.com to get the book. Once you've read the book, Mary Jo will meet with you one-on-one and help you determine where and how to get started. She will most likely also touch on some estate transition ideas, financing ideas, business growth or startup ideas, and many other things she has experience with from helping thousands of farmers and ranchers. Check out farmingwithoutthebank.com and the Farming Without the Bank podcast today. Very excited to be joined today by John Haskell and Wally Olson. Uh, Both of them uh, have been guests before, John more recently, but Wally multiple times. And we're going to talk to them today about the why and how of scaling a business and how that's different from just growing a business. So uh, very excited for this conversation. Always good to get these two uh, in the same uh, Zoom call, as it were, and, and talk to them about how we think about these things. And so how do we scale a business? Why should we scale a business? And how is that different from, from growing a business? Wally, John, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Welcome back to both of you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Welcome. Well, uh, George Walker, we're going to blame him for this. He, he reached out to us and said, hey, I'd love to hear a conversation, uh, I think, more probably between t- John and Wally, but uh, I'll, I'll loop in here to maybe provide some questions and, and follow up and he said, but let's talk, I'd like to hear what you guys think about scaling a business. And I, and I think that uh, as we've talked a little bit, that maybe the place to start this conversation is uh, the difference between growing a business and scaling a business. Uh, so Wally, were you, wanting to, were you wanting to take that start? Uh, when, you, when you look at the, you know, the definition of growth and scaling, you know, growth you add revenue, but you add a whole lot of cost. You know, you got to probably have more labor, more of this, more land. And and with scaling, what scaling to me is, is you're adding revenue, but not necessarily adding, you know, as many costs. There will be some costs, but you will not, uh, you know, uh, be as many. And, and you can probably add revenue you know, much faster than the costs go up. That's that's the thing to me. And it's really intrigued me since I retired. And what I do is when I go to put animals out with somebody, my goal is to help them scale their business. I'm going to put my cattle or my sheep in there, but we're not going to add the incremental costs of, you know, I don't have to have my cattle off separate. I don't have to, you know, whatever bulls you use is, fine with me because and stuff and and then another thing is in this industry is is we do not we focus on growth and and cutting costs and different things but we we don't think about exercising scaling and to me it's huge 
So in this in this industry or in this business in in this lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, uh, a, a lot of times the paradigm is that I make more money by working more hours or working harder, and so it's kind of a a paradigm challenge, I would say, to people to say that you could increase revenue without increasing labor and land, and so could you? Help me understand how that works. How does that flesh itself out? Go ahead, John. You have a good definition for it. Okay, so i i want to I want to put these major resource categories into three, or, or make it, let's put our costs into three major categories, right? Land, labor, and capital. And if and if and if I can add to my productivity, add to my income without increasing all three of those. And I am on the continuum of, you know, uh, of scaling. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so with that, then just like you're saying, most of the time we are talking about growth in the con- in the context of working harder in this, in this area, we are talking literally about adding productivity without adding either land, labor, or capital. So not adding capital, right. Would be maybe either taking in somebody else's cows or making your cows more productive. And we'll talk about, and from a dollar standpoint, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, So uh, not adding more labor is things like, you know, we, we improve our grazing or excuse me. Yeah. We improve our herd management, right? So we combine herds. Okay. And we now have reduced the labor cost per animal because we've got more stuff all together. Uh, and then land improving our grazing management, right? We have put, we have, we are by putting animals together and by, you know, using a grazing system, we are often increasing the productivity of the land itself without adding more land. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And I'm not sure if I answered your question. Well, no, that's exactly it. How do we do it? Well, we, we either add more cows other people's cows, so we aren't increasing capital, or yep. we combine herds, so we're decreasing labor, or we make our grazing better so that we're more efficiently using the land. Have I got yep. it? And then, yeah, that's great. And then let's add let's add one other part on that on that on the income side, uh, uh, where and I, we're going to talk about these in more detail, I think, but um, <clears throat> where marketing comes in as as Wally and Doug and a number of others teach it. That, you know, as it originally came from Bud Williams, that is an opportunity for us to increase the, the money turnover or increase the margin per unit without without adding to any of those costs. And so in my mind, marketing is the if we think about the amount of leverage that we have with each of these tools in our toolbox, marketing is clearly the biggest. Hmm. Right. We can we can add significant amounts of income without adding any other costs. Um, gra- grazing management often becomes the second one, right? And and I'm going to pair grazing management stockmanship together a little bit. I think I think there's a role for both of those, and they definitely interact. Um, and so again, now we now we are making our land and our animals more productive, right? <clears throat> so by reducing health problems, by increasing individual animal productivity, and by in- increasing the productivity of the land. <laughs> Right. We are scaling. <clears throat> and then and then again, to just, you know, w- if we could add some polywire electric fence, which is incredibly cheap and and, you know, one act, one and a half times our productivity, then here we are. We've, we've, we've done bigger or excuse me, we've done better before we've done bigger. Mm. And I think the focus on the margin first and, and looking at turnover in dollar numbers as opposed to per head numbers or per acre numbers uh, is the place over and over again. You know, when Wally and I talk through these things, when I look at other people's data, it's the place where we really win first by increasing the by increasing the margin and having a highly high performing business. We do a lot better than if we grow a marginal business. Right. Yes. And this is kind of back to that story that that I told on uh, the episode that we just did together, John, about the guy who scaled an unprofitable business and basically what that meant is he went broke faster. 
Yep. So, uh, need a bigger truck. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to, we want to get the business right and, and get the, the margin, uh, really right as far as gross margin per unit. And then, and then when we have that, go look at scaling. So could you give me an example? I would, I would here. Go ahead. Go ahead. I love debates. I would debate with you, Clay, there that, uh, that, uh, you know, what what to, to me he was growing his business he was adding costs and stuff whereas with scaling you take what you have and just get more out of it you don't add any costs right much i mean you got to and we'll come up with some examples but to me to me what gets a lot of people in trouble is they're into the growth mode and they have not made it like John's always talking about you make it better and then you grow. So you you scale it to make it as good as you can get those resources. And then you go find more resources and grow. Sure. And what we're doing is we're making that return on investment line steeper, right? Rather than just kind of an incremental linear increase uh, where it's one one unit of growth in the in terms of labor land or capital equals one u- unit of return it's uh we're getting a return faster than we're inputting more land labor and capital is basically what you're saying as far as the scaling is is concerned that is correct so could you give, can, give, can we yep, sorry can i can we give a couple of examples that's exactly I think what i was going to ask for <laughs> okay perfect we're, I'm going to give a non-example first, and then I am going to, and then let's go into some ag examples. Or does, yeah. Uh, if I, let's say I make, you know, fine handcrafted furniture. My office is actually in an old carpenter shop. The guy that owned the house before uh, had this wood shop, right? If I make, you know, fine handcrafted furniture made by me, and my name is on every piece that is an inherently not scalable business, right? Every time I sell a product, it takes my time, it takes my thought, it takes my money, right? I buy the materials, I do the work, I chunk one out. Here's a fine chair made by John Haskell, which is a phrase you'll never hear in real life because I can't make anything, but that's just an example. Uh, An ag example of something that is similar to that, where my growth is linear with my effort. And I want to come back to a topic you brought up earlier about sort of the self-employed thing concept you kind of touched on. But uh, if I am a custom farmer, when I, if I'm going to add more volume, you know, once I get to a certain, you know, once I get to the capacity of the number of hours in a day and the number of acres I can cover in my current equipment, If I want to do more, I need more of what a friend of mine calls meat in the seats, meaning I need somebody else sitting in a tractor and I may even need another tractor. So if I'm in a custom farm twice as much, I need more labor and I need more equipment. Okay. And the equipment and capital in this case, obviously go right. They go together. Uh, I, I usually need more land. Also, if I'm a farming enterprise like that, a custom farming enterprise, and many farming enterprises are literally not scalable. <clears throat> Meaning I can't, there's no, there's no more leverage, right? I can go to a bigger tractor and a few things, but all of those, you know, the costs all come with those things. We have tried farming bigger a lot and, and the margin is very poor and you can make it work, if, especially if you have deep pockets, but it, it doesn't often result that people farm bigger and then get a lot richer. Beyond, beyond some basics, right? Assuming you're at a, a sort of a stepwise, the first step level of capacity. Livestock businesses, on the other hand, are very scalable. So imagine if I produce a movie that, uh, in, in, so take, a, take the example of a, producing a play versus producing a movie. If I produce a play and I get my friends together and we act it out and we have an audience, that is not scalable. As soon as I record that on a, on a video camera and now I can play it on YouTube. Now it is scalable, right? I can increase my audience without uh, adding any additional work. It just pulled, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of work at getting it uploaded on YouTube, right? But it's trivial relative to the size of the production. Livestock businesses, when we see people really in, change their grazing management, change their stockmanship, uh, change their marketing, 
suddenly we have a business operating at, at a much higher level, right? Uh, generating a lot more profit, right? And the land base is the same. The equipment is the same. The labor is the same. And, and the capital is the same. We did a podcast here recently where we talked about growth specifically, and we talked a lot about sell by within a breeding herd. And one of the examples uh, involved a huge increase in income on a pretty small operation. And the best part about all of it was there was no additional debt, no additional land, right? Really no additional costs. One of the beautiful things about education is that it is, and we can think about leverage or scaling, but if I take a class, so, you know, I go take a marketing class, I can reapply the information I get from that class for the rest of my life. I don't have to, every time I want to think about marketing differently, I don't have to go back to Wally's class and start over again, right? I, Wally's class doesn't apply to a limited number of cows, right? If I take a stockmanship class uh, from Steve Cody, there's not like a 10,000 cow limit where after I've done that, I've got to go back, right? I mean, I, I can do, you know, we took classes from him in the, I don't know, early 2000s and use use that stuff still, right? So, so those are... Those that idea of leverage, you know, how much leverage do those actions have, I think is important in thinking about the continuum between growth and scaling. So back to your your play example, I think how in in theater, in the theater production world, how scaling actually happens is that they train other people to do that play and those people go out on the road and do it. And they'll train multiple crews to go out and do that same play and they'll go out and do it in other places. Do you think that that is in, in any way related to what you're talking about in scaling or is that a few steps down the road from, you know, the first thing is we, we do is we get our, our grazing management right, our stockmanship right, our, you know, allocation of resources right. And then we look at maybe sending other people out to scale it, uh, uh, in that way, or is are those things related in your mind? It's a great question. Wally, you want that one? Well, I think I think uh, you know all of the above is correct, and because you know, in theory, Clay, that's what I do is, and uh, uh, you know, you can, you know, like we were talking about, you know, with scaling, there's there's some costs that come along, and I will give you an example is. Is this if you if you improve your grazing so you can run more animals, you know, so so you don't you aren't picking up the uh, overhead costs of of running more animals, but you got to go buy the animals. So you got there's an incremental cost of buying those animals or keeping other animals or wherever you acquire these. There's those costs, but you don't have the cost of hiring more people, buying more trucks buying or renting more land so so there the, the, you got to understand there's these incremental costs that yeah there's going to be more costs if you're getting good at scaling but your returns on on your investment is going to be tremendous so since wally likes to debate i'm going to take the contrary position there i think in the case of your play example that is not an example of scaling or and again i'm viewing this as a continuum right growth on one end scaling on the other and we're sure. somewhere in the middle <laughs> But if I if I have to hire the whole production company, I have to rent the venue, right? I have to sell the tickets. I mean, I, I have definitely gained by doing more plays if the margin is good. But the only thing I'm leveraging there is the is the writing of the play, mm. which might be the lowest cost in that whole process. And I don't know anything about play yeah. production, so you can. Right. Uh, but but again, the the scaling is the video. Yep. Right. Yep. Where I don't. And again, if we think about land, labor and capital. Right. And, and capital can sub for some of those for some of the you know, things like equipment, you know, number of cows and things like that. That's what he's talking about. But if we think about those things, if I'm if I'm dropping one of them, I'm better off. But if I'm dropping all three, I'm I'm way better off. Yes, yes, yep. Okay. And so the back to the the farming example and, and those things that um, there's just really no way to get away from. You have to be there <laughs> to make this happen, and you or someone with the same skill set, right, right, and the same who basically tools. cost the same amount. You probably pay them more than you pay yourself. Yeah, right, right, and the same tools, right. It's not like um, right. they you can send them out there with 
without the same tools. You're, there's a, there is a finite number of combines that can go out into the field in under your control. And so it, it gets very, uh, very difficult to scale that because part, yeah. partly because of the cost of, of getting started, but cows do most of the work for you. And, uh, you know, adding one more doesn't usually require more overheads or, of labor or land right. if you're, if you're grazing is, is right. So. And, and I think that first sentence you just said there was, the, or the, about the cows doing most of the work is one of the keys. The beauty of a livestock enterprise is they bring their labor and they bring their tools. I think about this with stock dogs and I used to, I used to, I used to try to run a bunch of stock dogs and we had a lot of fun doing it. But one of the things that was fun about a stock dog is if they're bred right, they want to do the job, right? The way you punish a stock dog is don't let them do the job, right? That's about the cruelest thing you can do to a good cow or sheep dog, right? That dog wants to do the work you want accomplished, right? So a, a dog in my mind is an opportunity for scaling because you're recruiting a labor force that is, that, that makes an individual, you know, the labor that you actually pay for a lot more productive. And they, and they come at it with an attitude of this is doing this job is the best thing in the world. Right. So tr try to stop them anyway. Uh, but, but that idea that the livestock, they bring their own harvesting equipment, right? They have tongues, they have teeth, they have, they have a rumen, right? They, they have the ability to do the work. Whereas when we farm, um, and some of us try to run livestock this way, but when we farm, we have to do the work. Corn does not harvest itself. It does the growing, which is good, uh, but it but it will not put itself in the bin. The cows, with a little bit of encouragement, will put themselves on the truck, right? Yep. And so in the ranching for profit world, we would say that the the tends to be the biggest, biggest uh, barrier to profitability is too many overheads. And that is, that is land and labor, you know, basically anything connected to the land or anything that we use uh, to get jobs done is that we have too many of these overheads. And so this, this is about making sure that we're spreading those overheads out over more production units, more cows, and not increasing our, our, uh, not increasing our labor in proportion with the increase in cattle. It's where we're at. It's where we're at so far. Right. <laughs> right. And so that and so the second part of what you said, which is um, when I add one more, it doesn't require more labor. Right. The, the, if it, the, the first time I saw a herd of eighteen hundred cows in one bunch blew my mind. Right. But they were they were largely managed by one guy. And that that guy was you just never would guess it. But he was he got an unbelievable amount of work done. Because it was one guy and eighteen hundred cows. Yeah, he could have run nine hundred cows. Probably took taken about the same amount of effort. Now, when you have branding day, preg check day, those sorts of things, the effort goes up. But those are, I mean, it's like five days a year, right? Yeah, yeah. So have have we covered the labor, the the planned grazing, the marketing? Have we covered those things? Do we need to say more about each of those or any of them? I, I'm one thing I think that we need to really visit about and, and instill in people is the value of marketing. And and I will I and and the reason I'm very aware of this is is it's very hard to get the people that I put uh, animals out with to really get focused on marketing. You know that's what I bring to this business is is i'm always hammering on them you know on the marketing and uh uh you know because uh, just like i have an example of my brother-in-law you know he changed over from a conventional cow calf person selling call cows and stuff to speeding up his turnover and and he increased his sales by by uh, 44%. I mean, he took an average sale of like $800 up to $1,200, you know, and he didn't spend any money to do that. And that is, I think, maybe a not very often thought of way of increasing turnover is selling cold cows sooner or, or selling cows sooner, you know, 
before uh, they become cold cows. Right, before yes. they're before, <laughs> before they're depreciated or 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 uh, yeah, selling them as whatever age. You know, I don't want to I don't want to pin you down to an age, Wally, because I know you don't like that. But uh, selling them. <laughs> Uh, selling them sooner in their life cycle than you would have in a conventional model is is one way to increase turnover. Is that an accurate right. accurate assessment? And another thing, uh, the same thing to me. Like if I was in the grass fed beef business, you know, if if you are you know a womb to the tomb kind of grass fed beef producer, you know. Well, you still don't want to use your steers. To me, what you want to do, if you can do it, is is you breed your heifers. You get a calf out of that heifer, and then uh, you harvest her because that calf. And she's open as a three year old. Yeah, that calf pays for a lot of your costs. Sure, you understand what I'm trying to say. And and also, I don't know about the uh, the the tax implications, but. Uh, you know, I truly believe since you held her to, uh, you know, for breeding purposes and then you harvest her, I think you could capital gains that, which is tremendous when you start you know, to get rid of the, the self-employment tax. You know, you got to manage your retirement if you're going to do that and and capital gains. It's tremendous. The savings you have there. No, let me let me add this on on. Uh, on the, that concept of selling cows, whether it's a grass fed deal or, or whether it's not, if you are, it, how many of us would love to double the price of the calves that we sell, right? Calves are often the product we think of as that's what we sell, right? So here a couple of years ago, they were selling for, you know, 800 bucks or less. All right. Now I could get $1,600. That would be, you would be very happy with that result, right? When, when we switch into a system like what Wally's talking about, we literally often more than double the price of the cows that we are selling. Okay, now we often don't think about the cow part because we're in the cow-calf business, meaning we sell calves. We're, we raise good quality steers and good quality, you know, okay. When we reframe our thinking a little bit and focus on the cow side, we have the ability to add, you know, the cow income. I don't care what kind of quality calf you produce. Cow income is a significant part of your income. Uh, in, in a lot of operations, let's just say it's 20%, you know, on a per head basis. Okay. Um, if I can double that, it's a huge lever, right? And the chance of me doubling the price of the cow I sell is so much higher mm. than doubling the price of the calf, right? What would it take to take, you know, if I'm selling calves right now for, let's say a thousand dollars a head, what's it going to take to get that to 2000? What's it? It is literally investing the next 18 months so that you can do a, a farm to table type program. Mm -hmm. But I can take, instead of selling $800 cull cows, I can sell $1,600 bread cows without that much effort, right? The, the difference is there. The market already sees that doubling. So now instead of having 20% of my sales in dollars being cull cows, Right. And 20 percent being in, in number of head. Right. As my herd replacement. Now I take that 20 percent in cow numbers and double the income off of that. Um, it, the, the numbers I'm using are not exactly right, but it, it, I have a number of customers that they are doing that. And now cow sales are literally half of their total income. They have not reduced their calf income. They have increased cow sales to where it is now half of the total mm. <clears throat> and some of them have probably increased calf sales and still, <laughs> you know, they've, they've, they're running more ahead than they were when they started, but there's. Yeah. If you can, right. If you can do all of them, then all the better. Right. But what they often wind up doing is increasing their uh, open heifer sales. Right. So if you follow Burke Teichert's model and expose yep. you know, more heifers, that sort of thing, then you have, well, now you've added value to those because you're, your cull animal out of an open heifer or out of a heifer breeding program is still a high quality animal as contrasted <laughs> with the example Wally gave where you're selling a three-year-old right in at the sale barn an open three-year-old is not worth very much. Right. And, and many people across the country have troubles with the three-year-olds getting rebred. Right. So one solution is what Wally suggested, which is uh, you know, add more value to them by putting them into a meat enterprise, right? Or a direct -to consumer enterprise of some kind, uh, you know, adding value to that undervalued animal. Uh, the other, 
the other great option is manage your replacement heifer program so you have much fewer of them, right? Select for the highest fertility animals. Yeah. And see that that is that is one thing that the uh and, and uh, I'm going to get on my soapbox here, Clay. All right. But you know, we're so we're so focused on longevity, you know, and and to me, what we need to be focused on is getting, uh, you know, put the genetics in there so that the first calf heifer rebreeds to come with her second calf. That's where the focus needs to be because. I, I, you know, they talk about indigenous knowledge of the ranch, and and my thoughts are is that if you have a, a heifer calf born on the ranch, she's raised on the ranch, she raises one or two calves on the ranch, she has got as 99% of the indigenous knowledge that a 12-year-old cow has. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, I'd love to have somebody debate that with me since Haskell says I love to debate, you know, and, and stuff and and uh but I didn't Wally, say you love the Wally, debate. I said you're difficult. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Wally, Wally, I love my cows and I I hate my grass. Isn't that what Bud said I was supposed to do? Love my cows that's and hate a, my grass. That's a, you know that's a you're, you're dyslexic with that. <laughs> oh, oh okay. <laughs> hey, but but let me let me put another thing on this because I you know what what and I the, the cow trading thing sometimes gets a bad wrap of, well, you know, I love my cows, just like, why would I sell a cow in the prime of her life? I, this is something, for example, my wife is a great, you know, you just got those calves to right where they're going good. Why are you going to sell them? Like, well, that's what we do, right? Okay. But here's the thing. If I really love my cows and I'm super proud of them, why would I not sell them to someone else for top dollar, right? Most of us raise a cow that is a very good quality product. Most of us raise a cow that has a lot of value to someone else. I want nothing more than to see the livestock I, I sell go on to their next home, right? Whether that's the slaughterhouse, whether that's, you know, their their new owner who's going to take them until they get, this, you know, whatever. I want them to be fantastically happy with that animal. And if it's an animal that I am very proud of, I am excited to sell it to somebody else. Now, I'm not going to sell it at a discount. I'm really proud of it. Right. I think I think I've done great work here. I think I've got a great product. I, I have no problem asking, you know, for top dollar for that. But I am invested now in my customer success. Right. And that is where we when we talk about value production for the next level, I don't want to do that for free. Right. So I, so I try. So I try to use, you know, timing and, and location and, and my skills. Right. To add value to that. But if I think of myself like a female seed stock producer, and this is a concept I learned from Ben Bailey a long time ago that I didn't learn when he actually taught me. It took years for this to sink in. But if I am a female seed stock producer, I am producing huge value for someone else. And I have the skills to do it again. And, and that's, that's I think, what Wally has brought to the table in a lot of ways is that, um, again, it's not like I'm trading cows because I hate cows. I'm trading cows because I love building a great cow and putting it into someone else's hand and mm. have it go on with them for the next five or 10 years and be very successful. It's, but it's a paradigm shift, right? You've got to get, you've got to, you have an old way of thinking that you've got to get rid of and you got to find a new way of thinking about it, a new perspective and say, you know, where we are not in the business of raising cows that will last forever here. <laughs> We're in the business right. of raising cows that can go somewhere else and last forever if they so choose right. to to adopt that business model. Uh, so right. so say we've done it, we've scaled a business, we've we've got our grazing right, we've got our labor uh, right, we're getting maximum return for our investment at some point uh, on this square of land that I have been entrusted with the care of. The scale becomes limited right there's a there's a ceiling for that scale on this piece of land and with my labor and with my capital but if we've got it done right and we've got a high gross margin we're we're doing very well and so the capital is growing in in a a reserve somewhere what do we do then where do we go how do we how do we take the next step in scaling that business outside of the bounds of our own a, a sphere of influence and control on this piece of land. 
then to me is is you know you used to go start finding other people where you can replicate this and and one thing uh, let me tell you from experience when you do this there's going to be some glitches in the road so you need to have a very good uh group some growing pains because you will have them and uh uh, you know, just just like uh, we just came through, uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm a cover crop grazer now, and uh, where I graze these cover crops, we had a set of steers that had a 12% death loss, you know, and, and, you know, my God, you know, but the thing is, is we had it managed right, and they still made a 23% return on your money in nine months, so, you know, that's... Uh, you know, I, I you have to, you know, you have, you know, it would have been nice if we'd only had a one percent death loss. It would have really been a good deal, but this is still a good deal, you know, and and so you need to, you know, you you need to understand that you, you know, well, here's one thing that that uh, you know, in, in ranching for profit, and if anybody's listening to this and they haven't been to ranching for profit school, here comes a Dallas Mount ad real quick. Go <laughs> because it's a great thing you can do. Go to a ranching for profit school before you come to a marketing school, so you know what to do with all the money that I'm going to make you. That's just <laughs> deep. But now they use they use a uh, you know a ten percent opportunity costs, and if you start doing that, you're going to make. 10% opportunity costs. What you need to do is ramp that opportunity cost up to 25% or whatever. And then if you can't find something to work, understand to back down. This is one of the greatest things that I learned from Bud Williams is to, you know, you put pressure on and you, and, but then you got to back off. Well, if you can't make 25, go to 22. If you can't make 22, go to 18. You're still a lot better off than the 10%. But you've got to, <clears throat> that's one thing most people can't do is concede and back down. Mm. And and you need to be able to do that. Well, you have no room to concede and back down if you're at 10%. That's correct. You have to start higher if you want to leave yourself yep. room to concede and back down, right? Yep. So yep. I think what we're doing here is we're talking about this self-employed uh, to business owner transition. Right, we've gone from self-employed, where we had a, a really good gross margin with a uh, with a business that had good grazing, uh, good land management, good labor, good capital management, all that. And now we're we're making that shift up to a business owner, where we're taking that and we're replicating it with somebody else. Right? Is that's the trans right. transition we made in the last three minutes of this episode? Right. Okay, so so here, what becomes important is is this. There's some passing of the torch, and the word for that is delegation. And I want to draw a distinct distinction between delegation and abdication. Right? <laughs> abdication. I just hand somebody a wad of mess and say, "You fix it." Thankfully, I work with them. You know, some of our employees are wonderful at covering my problems because you know they they just fix it. That's great, but that's not how you really want to grow a business. Delegation involves a couple of important things, and, and uh, there are some people that speak really well about this. I actually love the way Dave Ramsey talks about delegation. Uh, he talks about, first of all, building trust, and I think in that in that trust is, is training, okay? Uh, training, and then again, we go back to this walk before you run. So I give you a little piece, and then and then you do it well, I give you a little more, right? This is the, the parable of the steward written all over again. Uh, delegation is, is two main things in my mind. There's process and there is culture. Uh, when I look through a business, I, and I think all of us can do this, we can look through our own business and see what are the jobs I don't have to do. So we often, it's interesting to me because I often hear relatively novice business owners say, well, I need a, I need a manager, right? Who can do everything I can do. And you know, and, and I think that's an incredibly flawed place to start because that's running before you walk. There's probably a few things that I can hand to somebody else that they can do as well and often better than I can. OK, so let's just take in a in a in a business like yours, Clay, in the in the preaching business. Right. The first thing you're not going to ask your new apprentice to do is write a sermon and give it. I'm going to be in Hawaii. Right. That would be abdication. 
you are going to maybe ask them, would you do a little research? I've got a portion of my talk that is going to center around this topic. I would like you to find me some scripture that, you know, supports or refutes what I'm Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, in, in my current business, one of the things that I have been slow to delegate and at my own peril is literally answering the phone, <laughs> right? That's something that someone else could do, right? It's, I'm not going to say it's low skill, but it, it's just, there are lots of people that are good at answering the phone. Um, anytime we can identify very small chunks of our business that are easy to sort of create a process around and easy to train someone in that, that makes us more effective, right? So in theory, if someone's taking a piece, so trucking is a good example. Most of us don't own trucks and haul all of our own livestock, right? We've delegated that to someone else. And, and that's something that there are lots of people that are willing to do it. Yes, we have to pay for it. Uh, and we can go through the math of that, you know, whether it's better to own it or to have somebody else do it. Uh, but it's the same basic concept. I don't have to do all of the parts. And as soon as you identify that, you know, and, and embrace that idea, now that allows you to grow a lot more. Once you've scaled it, right, you've already done the better. Now, now we put our foot on the accelerator and do bigger. Um, and then the other part of that, so delegation involves, you know, in my mind, creating a process, right? What do I want the outcome to be and what are the steps that are required to get there? And, and having all of those very clearly identified is important, right? We talk about that often in terms of like a, uh, drawing a blank on what the term ranching for profit uses, but like your key performance areas for an employee, right? That's what are hard. the... Oh. Yeah, that also there, but there's another in our, in our job description. Areas. Right? Effectiveness areas. That's it. Thank you. So I, you know, clearly identifying those and with it, with someone new identifying how you get to those, right? So I don't take a novice and just give them the end result. I hold their hand for a while to help them get there and then they can modify it after they become skilled. The other huge part is culture. And I think this is one that Wally does a really good job of focusing on. Uh, and culture in my mind is the stuff that covers what happens when the process either doesn't quite work right or when you encounter an unexpected hiccup? Okay. Culture is the, is the unifying mental framework, right? That tells us what to do when the answer isn't clear, right? Helps us make decisions. Culture has a lot to do with vision and mission, right? We have to back all the way up to why sometimes, why are we doing this? And sometimes that helps us answer the questions of the unexpected that arise. OK, but but when we build culture in an organization, we are developing a, a shared intellectual capital, if you will, that allows us to make good decisions. So uh, just take my wife and I as two people that in theory agree on raising our children. That doesn't mean we do exactly the same thing. And there are we just had a discussion last night, literally before bed about, hey, this didn't you know, we were kind of on different tracks here. What was going on? And by having that discussion last night, not only are we able to sort of understand what the other person is thinking, but also identify some places where maybe we hadn't communicated quite fully about what the goals and, were and what maybe the specifics of the situation were. And, and we have those arise all the time, right? If I'm going to go cut a hayfield or irrigate a hayfield, let's just say, there, I know some people that start at the bottom and some people that start at the top, right? If you're right, you, you might. There are lots of different ways to slice this deal. If we all have the same understanding of what the end goal is and why we are in this business and we're willing to have some discussions, then to my mind, that culture allows things to grow much more quickly because in part trust is developed and also a sort of overarching decision-making framework is developed as opposed to handing someone a map of a field Here's where you're going to put the dam on day one. Here's where you're going to put the dam on day two. Here's where you're going to put the dam on day three. Does that, does that make Absolutely. sense? Absolutely. Yes. Well, what happens if I only have half the CFS I expected? Well, on the first plan, you just do it based on the plan. The second situation I want, ooh, I've only got half the CFS, so it's probably going to take me, you know, one and a half times as long or two, two and a half times as long to get that acreage covered. Yeah. So a couple of things on that. Uh, um, first of all, there's a book called, that I bought, but never read. It, but the video, I think, communicated the point of the book. So did I really need to watch it? Did I need to spend the time reading it? It's called Killing Cockroaches. And it's by a guy named yeah, Tony great, Morgan. Great, great. 
And he says in the video, he says, basically the bottom line is that as a business owner, you do what only you can do, right? John shouldn't be answering the phone. Somebody else can do that, right? Uh, he, he tells a story about he was in his office doing some high value work and somebody came knocking on his door, said there's a cockroach in the lunchroom and he had to go kill it. He's like, well, somebody else could have killed the cockroach. I shouldn't be doing that. I should find somebody else to do that. So that's the first thing. Second, and then what I, where I want to go after this is hearing Wally talk about culture, if we can, for a second. But the, the apprenticeship uh, paradigm, the apprenticeship continuum is this. I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, I help. You do, I watch. That's the apprenticeship paradigm or the apprenticeship continuum. And we oftentimes start with uh, you do, and like you said, I abdicate. (laughs) I go away. I don't even watch. And ultimately... Ultimately, I just come back later with harsh judgment. Right. right. <laughs> Tell you how you did it all wrong. Ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, if you send somebody out with a, you put the the tarp here for the irrigation example that you gave. If you always send them out, you've never gotten past. You do, I help, or or I do, you help, basically, because I'm the one coming right. up with the plan. You know, yep. you've never gotten past giving them the ability to make a decision on their own. You're still making all the decisions. You really, back to our conversation, at that point, all you've done is grown your business. You haven't scaled it, right? Would you agree with that? Good question. I didn't think about that. It, tur- because, it turns out the difference between growth and scaling requires a lot more thought than <laughs> when we originally agreed to have this discussion. <laughs> uh, but but I, would, I would argue, if nothing else, you're growing your business more effectively. Okay, so so whether that falls under the definition sure. of growth or scaling, we could debate. But if I, you know, if I've hired a bunch of robots who just go and follow my every command exactly as I've written them, I, I don't care who you are. You're not going to be very effective, and you're not going to be very effective in ag where all of the variables are changing all of the time, right? Right. But so take our dam example. One of the cool decisions that has to be made is: Do I get across the the top part of this field? In, a, in X amount of time, or do I get the whole field wet, right? Because again, when you change the CFS coming down the ditch, you're either going to get acreage out away from your dam, or you're going to get acreage along your ditch. Which which one are you going to choose? And teaching people how to make that decision. And, and just like you're saying, supporting them in the early stages of doing that, but training them how to make that judgment, I think is that is a high leverage event, right? Yep. Wally, process. Wally, can you talk about culture? Well, to me, uh, uh, you know, when I when I put animals out with people, uh, you know, I, I don't tell them what to do. I go look at their operations. If it's compatible with my beliefs and philosophies, I'll put animals out with you. And and uh, you know, my my deal is is the reason I own these animals is to make profit. And that's what I want. I don't care whether they're Angus or, you know, I don't, it, and, you know, and, and so I'm interested in, in what, what they are willing to do and, and, uh, uh, and changing uh, over is uh, different philosophies. I mean, we are into, uh, we're into technology, you know, technology and, and I mean spin especially in grow yards you know putting caves in grow yards oh my God, we can spend money now and and needless to say I do not have any cattle in a grow yard at this time and it will probably be a long time true I do I'll probably go buy some tomorrow and put them in a grow yard so you know I'm the biggest hypocrite that ever walked the face of the earth but, uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, you got to, you know, the culture is, is, you know, this is, uh, you know, and, and boy, I tell you what, I don't try to change people, you know, and stuff very much. And, uh, and uh, I'm finding, you know, I'm finding people, matter of fact, I'm going, you know, I'm getting ready to move to the next level and be an investor. I have found some people that I truly believe can manage a business a lot better than I do, you Mm. know, and so. 
I'm willing to try that just to learn. You know, that's the one thing I learned from Bud Williams. Man, I love trying new stuff just to learn. And uh, my wife says, you maybe know enough right now. No, I want you to stop this learning because learning usually has tuition. And it does. Yeah, and and the the what you learned at Wally Olson's marketing school and what you learned at Ranching for Profit is the cheapest tuition you'll ever pay when it comes to learning. <laughs> because sometimes learning from your mistakes is pretty expensive. Oh man, yes. So, and we touched on this a little bit because I think uh, as you as Wally was talking about, um, you know, the the beginning process of starting something new, right? There, let's let's make sure we think about risk management. Risk management has a, a couple of big components. The biggest one is walk before you run, right? Dollar cost average or figure out some way of going in so that you stage that in pieces because there will be tuition and you'd like to keep that tuition contained. How does that sound? Like you say, the school, you know, a thousand, couple thousand bucks for a school, <laughs> cheap. One great, one, a couple of great truckloads of mycoplasma calves, makes ranching for profit or Bud Williams stockmanship or any of those look really cheap. Um, the the other risk management tools in my in my mind that are very important are are margin right. So having a big profit margin to start so that if things go wrong, it's like hey, okay, you still got some padding. And then the other is retained earnings, and and the opposite of retained earnings is debt, right? So being heavily leveraged in any of these situations really ties your hands, and and can tie your hands in dangerous ways. Uh, our our most profitable customers are growing by, you know, by generating a lot of margin in their business and then recycling it into the business. That's where the compound growth happens. Yep. And make it- if it goes bad, there's an easy place to back up to. Go ahead, Wally. I'm sorry. And, and one thing, uh, and I'm, I'm very blessed that I have a, a gentleman that I work with uh, that we we – run undivided interests in cattle. We're not partners in any way. We got a document that says we are not partners in any way. We run undivided interests. And and him and I are are game to put basically we'll put a, a load of cattle out with I mean within reason with about anybody. But but what we're doing is one load of cattle you can work if there something goes wrong you can work your way out of. And by him and I being in this joint venture, we, we've cut our risk by 50 percent. And, uh, you know, you've got to look at dilution, you know, and uh, and that's, you know, I, and I'm I guess, you know, the only book that Bud Williams ever gave me the, the, to read was The Art of Contrary Thinking. And, and, you know, most people in agriculture, especially ranching, are rugged individualists, you know. And I'm just the complete opposite. I love to partner. I love to work with other people. I mean, just because the network that I have developed, you know, just like I can't find any grass in Oklahoma, you know, to run cows on. I want to own cows because I really believe that we are, as they say in Oklahoma, we're fixing to have a real run up in the value of cows, you know. But I have found grass in West Virginia. And, and since I had a network of people, you know, I can do that. And, and you know, rather than be stuck on this one piece of, of property, you know, I, I can go just anywhere, you know. And yep. So how do we it know? Takes, it takes a skill set to, to, you know, you've got to learn how to do that. It's just like anything, any other business. you got to learn you know, and, and if your gut tells you don't do something, by golly, I have proven many times over, don't do it. Mm, yeah. So how do you know when it's time to make that transition from self-employed to business owner? And then we've kind of touched on the business owner to investor. I'm I'm kind of surprised, Wally, to hear you say that you're just now thinking about that transition. I would have put you in the investor category already. But so how do, how do you know when it's time to make that transition? Well, to me, <clears throat> one thing is, is, is is my time you know i'm 71 years old and uh and like a neighbor said you know i'm getting everything done but i'm letting a lot of things go and uh that's where i i've got a set of cows that i don't think i i'm trying to remember the last time i seen them and and you need to do diligence you know that is not the way you do business and so i've realized that uh and also i am uh 
you know, I've got some other things I want to do. And, uh, and so I'm, and also I'm, I'm really interested in learning how to transition over to being an investor and, and, you know, cause I would, you know, I've got money in the stock market out with money managers and, and I can see, I can, so I'm looking for my money managers in agriculture. That's, uh, that's what I'm, I'm looking for. I understand there's a lot more risk. But there's also a lot more opportunity and you can manage the risk. So basically the problem is it with what I was talking about, where I said I would have put you in the investor category is my misunderstanding of what an investor is, right? Because ultimately you're still a business owner at this point where you're finding places to put cattle out with people and, and those kinds of things. That's that's a business owner that's what a business owner does rather than yes. what an investor does. And, and basically, uh, you know, where, where it comes down to, or I look at the difference between a business owner and an investor is who calls the shots. You understand what I'm saying? You know, I'm, you know, I hear, hear, hear is, you know, a set of cows, but, uh, you know, we're going to sell the calves now. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to sell those cows at five years old. You know, we're going to do this. And my deal is, 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 okay, here is, here is a hundred thousand dollars. And I want fifteen thousand back. When or I mean, on top of it, like, yes, yes. Uh, I want fifteen on top of the hundred thousand I gave you back at this point, sometime in the future. Yeah. And yep. And I will, I will gladly, you know, visit visit with them, and 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 I don't even talk about consulting with them. I'm, I will visit with them about options, but it's their decision to make. Sure. Yeah. And, and this may be something that is a little bit of a continuum also, Clay. Uh, mm. You know, again, I, I love Kiyosaki's quadrants, you know, and it's nice to think about those as exactly the way they are. But, but there is some gradation from one. And I think what Wally is describing in his investing is maybe becoming more passive. Mm. Sure. Yep. Right. So gotcha. so if you if you say I am going to own cows and put them other places, you know, you're sort of in that gray area between the two, right? Whereas I am going to hand you a stack of money and here's what I expect in return. That's a different, it's a different phase, right? That's clearly a different phase, right? Right. right. Yep. Anything that you two want to promote, anything that you guys want to talk about, joint ventures you've got going on, individual uh, classes and things like that you've got going on that you want to share with people? Well, I have a, a uh, online school coming up. I think it's February 20th to the 22nd. Right? Yes, that's, that is an online school, and it, it will run for three days, for three I'm hours, from nine to noon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can uh, just go to ranching.fyi and uh, find the information to register and stuff. So a thousand, it's $1,000 if you uh, have not, and if you... If you have attended school, it's a hundred dollars. I see. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes page for today for that. Uh, and I think when this releases, that'd be the week after this releases. So there's an opportunity for people to go out and get involved in that. John, you got anything? Uh, a couple of things. We didn't talk much about this, but obviously Ranch Right LLC is a, a sort of bookkeeping, coaching and consulting business where we where we do the bookkeeping and accounting for our customers. And then we look carefully at their business and sort of help them walk through that process. Um, the ranching.fyi we just mentioned is a subscription website where we've accumulated a bunch of interviews and, and information there uh, designed to help people uh, be more helpful. And then we are in the court. Ranching.fyi is in a bit of a change, and some of the stuff that Wally and Cinnamon and I are working on is is about to make a change. We are working on a series of much more in-depth courses on individual topics, and we've some of these things we've already done some interviews for and that sort of thing. But actually, bringing people in in a in a just to make the contrast, Ranching for Profit is a week long class, right? teaches a lot of things. You go through them very quickly. We have taken a few of those things that we have real interest in and an expertise in and really drilled down. So we might take something that you cover in ranching for profit for a half a day to a day and a half and now talk about it over a 12 month period. Uh, we're a little ways away from the rollout of that. Some of the things we talked about in your, many of the things we talked about in our last uh, visit together, as far as, you know, asset progression, 
uh, are in that. And then some of the things in scaling and business management are, are going to come into that. So that is uh, something to kind of stay tuned for. The development process is always slower than I would like it to be. So I was hoping to have a number of these things rolling out by the first of the year. We're not there, but, but we will get there. But But this idea that we oftentimes we deal with these things at a surface level. Uh, once we get to a certain level of success and growth in our business now, we need to know a lot more. Uh, and how do we get there? Very good. And also, also, Clay, if anybody, you know, has questions or anything, just have them go to uh, Olson Ranch LLC and you can get my email address or call me. Uh, and if if they email me a question, put their phone number on it. Since I can't spell, I will call them back. <laughs> but I'm, I'm more than happy to you know help somebody out. Because a lot of people help me out a lot in my life. So very good. Wally, John, thank you guys for your time today. It was thank fun. You for the opportunity. Appreciate it. None of you are farming like you did 100 years ago. Why are you financing it like you did 100 years ago? The biggest part of your operation is the money that runs through your hands, and you let someone else control that. The bank gets the final say in what you get money for and when you pay it back. For many, this is a great relationship, until it's not. Farming Without the Bank shows you how you can take back control of your money so you can make it, so you can make the bank plan B instead of plan A. This is done by you creating your own banking system. You own and control. To learn more, tune into the Farming Without the Bank podcast and go to farmingwithoutthebank.com to get the book. Once you've read the book, Mary Jo will meet with you one-on-one and help you determine where and how to get started. She will most likely also touch on some estate transition ideas, financing ideas, business growth or startup ideas, and many other things she has experience with from helping thousands of farmers and ranchers. Check out farmingwithoutthebank.com and the Farming Without the Bank podcast today. Very good stuff there, as always, with those two. I really appreciate their perspective and the way that they think about these things and uh, some of the ways that they encourage us to approach uh, the business of ranching. Uh, Really excited to share with you also another partnership that we have on the Working Cows podcast. Uh, Coming your way over the next year, I have uh, contracted with the Understanding Ag Group run by uh, Dr. Alan Alan Williams, Gabe Brown, Shane New, and others. Um, Contracted with them over the next year to present uh, to produce 20 bonus episodes and th- those will be releasing basically a couple of them um, a couple a month we'll have two here in february and lord willing two every other month uh, of 2023 except for probably july but we'll see how the schedule works out so very excited about that um and so looking forward to the next couple of weeks here on the working cows podcast we'll have a couple of episodes coming your way Um, probably the regular Monday episode and then a Friday episode as well. So be on the lookout for that and make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss anything. Coming up next week on the Working Cows podcast, we will be talking to uh, Michael Sillick and Lynn Hoover. Michael Sillick, of course, is a part of the team there at C90 Ocean Minerals. And Lynn Hoover is a Uh, an agronomy guy that's been using the sea salt products that they have there at C90. Uh, So if you've been wondering about how to uh, make use of these things in an agronomic way, not just in a herd health way, this will be the episode for you. So really excited about that coming your way real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.